And today, what I'm going to do is instead of preaching a message, uh, I'm, I'm going to have them help me preach this message. I want you to hear from them. I want you to hear, their, let their lives speak. And so um, I'm going to first call uh, Allie. If you'll come and, and then share your story. And I know you've got some special people that are here. Please introduce okay. them. I will. Um, my parents surprised me this morning by driving in from the Kansas City area. So they're over there. And, uh, <laughs> and what I want to share with you all this morning is just how missions has impacted me in a personal way, and I'll be introducing someone else here in a second, but High Street also played a part in that uh, and how you, missions impacted me. Several years ago, you supported Jim and Sharon, and Sharon's over here, Smith. They were uh, in Ecuador serving as missionaries, and through their ministry, a young man by the name of Cesar came to know the Lord, and I'm very thankful for that because Cesar was my biological father, but right around my second birthday, he was in an accident and, and passed away. Um, but I know that he made a decision for the Lord. And even though I don't have any personal memories of him, I will see him again in heaven. And I am so grateful for that. And it was missionaries like them saying, yes, I will go. And churches like you supporting them and saying that I will give financially to missions, that they are able to go. And you um, made an impact in my life, whether you realize it or not. Um, right around my fifth birthday, I was adopted, grew up in Kansas City. Very thankful to have grown up in church at the age of eight. I trust the Lord as my personal savior. And grew up in a church just like this where missions is the heartbeat of the church. And I truly believe that that was a huge part of where I am today. And I surrendered to ministry, went to Bible college. And it was through a trip to Columbia as a sophomore in college that God called me back to the Latin people. And so now I have been in Columbia since 2014, working with churches, uh, working with children's ministry, youth, ladies, discipleship, small group, a lot of things. But the thing that most impacts me is just that um, God is able to use any of us, regardless of our status in life, whether you're single, whether you're married, um, to go and give the gospel to people that have not heard it and how he would use me Someone born in Ecuador, raised in Kansas, middle of the United States, nothing super exciting about it, to go back to South America, to go to Colombia so that the Colombian people can hear about him. And so I just want to encourage you in that way. And I want to finish my time just saying thank you uh, to each and seg each and seg oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, each and every single one of you that have prayed and given towards the Bible translation with the Choco people. Um, I was able to go a couple months ago with Lee, Lisa and Gary and visit what was going on there and just the, um, the excitement in their eyes to know that it was almost finished, but also to know that there are still so many people, yes, in Colombia, but around the world that do not have the Bible in their language and just how important that is so that they can hear about Jesus. And so I just want to personally thank you for giving so that the Colombian people can continue to hear about Jesus. Chris, come on up and uh, share with us your story. You know, a lot of times people think that uh, the missionaries, they grew up in church, they, you know, they have, they, they know the Lord, but you know, Chris, that's not your story, is it? Uh, and yet, here you stand today uh, as our missionary to Japan. Share with us. Thank you. So, you know, there's, there's a, a number of ways that missionaries uh, find their way to a field or, or are called to a particular field and uh, have their attention brought to a particular field. And for m myself and my wife, um, it was in 2015, there was a missionary that shared some statistics about Japan. We learned about the utter hopelessness of the Japanese people. There's about 127 million people in Japan, less than half of 1% of that population trust Christ as their Savior. And, you know, I think that, that percentage and that hopelessness really resonated in my heart because of my own story. You know, I was, I was raised in a very religious home, and uh, I was taught a lot of things growing up. I went to church every Sunday. I went to Sunday school. I was taught a lot of creeds. I was taught a lot of prayers. I was taught about the saints. But the one thing that I was not taught about is the hope that is in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. And when I was about 12 years old, I turned my back on those traditions, the traditions of my family and our religion. I turned away from it. I turned away from the hopelessness. I realized the hopelessness that was in those traditions. 
but I reached a really, really dark time in my life because at this point in my life, I realized, okay, I've turned away from this hopelessness, but I don't know where to find hope. And this is a place that many Japanese people find themselves. They're living every single day without the hope of the gospel. They're under so many pressures, pressures from family to hold up a, a family name and honor. Fa- uh, uh, they're, they're loyal to their jobs. They're, they're, they're pressured by their, by their employers. Oftentimes they work 80 plus hours a week, all in the name of honor. Sometimes never seeing their family all week. If, if they do, maybe one time a week. Because their loyalty is to their employer and to their nation. They face these pressures and oftentimes these people, they, they, they realize the hopelessness of such traditions. And the traditions of their religions as well. And they turn away from it. But at the same time, they, they're, they're turning away from hopelessness. They don't know where to find hope. And so likewise, that's, that's where I was at. And when I was 15 years old, there was a, a fellow student from my high school that came to me with the gospel. He brought his Bible to school every single day, and he opened up the word of God, and, and he shared the gospel with me and changed my heart. He shared it over and over and over again. O- over, over about a year, he invited me to, uh, to church over and over again. Eventually, I went to church. I went to his youth group, and I, I, heard, I heard the gospel preached over and over and over again. And I came to know the Lord as my Lord, and I came to know Christ as my Lord and Savior when I was 16 years old. See, we want to share that hope with the Japanese people, that hope that I received when I was 15 years old. We want to bring that hope to the Japanese people. You see, we have a huge opportunity, not just me and Miranda, but everyone in this whole building. We have a huge opportunity to bring the hope of Jesus Christ to a people that are so hopeless, who have never heard it before. And so I, I just, I pray that you will join us and, and partner along with us. And, and I pray that someone in this room will go, will surrender to go to Japan and preach this living word so they can receive hope. Thank you so much. We have been supporting Don and Phyllis Weeks. They have been in India for 15 or more years. Uh, and, um, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes, as they age, not that you've aged, uh, Don. I'm but old, I'm old. You're old. But I, I guess I was struck by the fact that Phyllis the other night said uh, that you came to her and suggested that maybe God was calling you to India, and she is 59 years old. Is that a time to start a new career? 49. If, for, 49. Please. Sorry, Phyllis. You're a good husband. Thank you. Twenty-nine, uh, actually. Yeah, so well. <laughs> so tell us your story. After pastoring for twenty years, um, at that time in our lives, we were pastoring in Sarasota, Florida, white beaches. You know, living the life down in Sarasota, having a great time and just in, enjoying what I was doing. Had an opportunity to go to India for two mission trips. By the time I was on the second mission trip, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that God wanted me to, to serve in India. I was 50 years old. Now, older than most of you. But you know what? I don't care if you're 15 or 50. God wants you to do something. It's time to do it. It's time to do it. And so... We went, long story, we went, God gave us 15 wonderful years in in India. I was, you know, God used us to train just just tons of people about your age. And God just sent them all over India and Myanmar and um, Nepal. And the work continues on. Over a period of time, we got kicked out of India. And as we came home, you know, we were really deflated. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, just want, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to retire and I'm going to get a job at Chick-fil-A because they're closed on Sunday. <laughs> that sounded like a good idea. Well, that was not God's idea at all. And God lit a fire in my heart and we just, we prayed intensely, opened our hearts, opened our hands and said, wherever, whenever, whatever, God. And so, yeah, 
God took that. He says, yeah, I, yeah, okay, I've got you. And he's sending us to England. And we're going to be able to reach some of our dear and wonderful Indian friends in England. There's over 3 million South Asians, almost 4 million. And we're going to have a chance to speak into that community. And we're going to have a chance to, to take charge of a small Bible college over there. And we want to plant a church. I want to plant a church like this that knows how to reach young Brits your age because you're the future. You're the future. And through all of this and in church, if, if something begins to burn in your heart about this thing called missions, don't ignore it. It just may be that God has something for you you never imagined could ever be. I was a kid growing up in inner city Miami, Florida. And if you would have asked me that I would have been to places I would have been, I would have never imagined. But you know what? I want to say something about this church. This church has been a missions church ever since the beginning. They have loved missions. They have supported missions. They have sent missions. And I want to say thank you, High Street Baptist Church. Thank you. And I want to encourage you to get behind the missions program because they are real people seeking to lead other real people to Christ. People with destroyed lives and are hurting. So I want to say thank you for the 17 years of support you've given us. God bless you. Thank you, Bob. I'm going to ask Dwayne to come on up and and just share with us. He and his family are in Ethiopia, a challenging place. Uh, and, you know, yet you're there and you've got a vision and it's exciting what God is doing. And we look forward to hearing reports of what he will do in the future. Share with us, if you would. Well, it's 2001 that God put in my heart the country of Ethiopia. And it wasn't until 2010 uh, that we actually surrendered and went up for approval to the country of Ethiopia. And you may be thinking, why did it take you so long uh, to surrender? The same reason many of you don't, because I am wired to be the protector and the provider for my family, just like all husbands and fathers are. And I had four children, and though I did not want to move them to Ethiopia because there was no way that I could take care of them or provide or even protect for them. And no one going to Ethiopia, that was all going to be stripped away from me. And so I wrestled with God for about eight or nine years, and God finally got a hold of my heart, and I surrendered to go off with him. And you know, to give you a story of what, how God had protected, it was about 2 a.m. one evening, we were in, asleep in our beds, and gunfire rung out around our house, and my wife and I literally, like, just jumped out of the bed and landed on the floor, and we went to our kids' room and grabbed them out of their room. We were on the second level of our house, and, and we grabbed them, and we went down below the, the wall line, as we have a wall around our home, and, and we just sat there and just listened to that, and with your four children, young children there, and, and just, man, I remember my prayer to God. It was short, it was repetitive, and it was over and over just saying, God, protect us in a way I cannot. God, protect us in a way I cannot. God, protect us in a way that I cannot. And there was that still small voice that just kind of crept into my heart, and he said, hey, 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 I told you, I'm never going to leave you, and I'll never, ever forsake you. I'm right here. And God has shown his hand of protection. If I told you stories, you wouldn't believe many of them of how God has protected and kept our family safe. And then the other part was the provision. Man, we had to sell everything, jump, put our small family into a van. I say small, six, six people in a van and, and travel around the country and try to raise funds. And again, God just showed his hand evident time and time again. And matter of fact, when we got to Ethiopia, my wife had put all over our house uh, little birds, uh, you know, stickers or tabletop things of, of birds. All, you cannot go anywhere in our house without a bird staring at you. And she did that to give us a constant reminder that just as God provided for Elijah from the ravens and how God provided using such little things, he takes care of his people. He takes care of his children. And when we came home in May, we were, one of our biggest things was raising funds for, to buy property for our church in Ethiopia that we've been granted to go forward with. 
And we landed with a daunting task. And again, I thought, God, there's no way we can do this. There's no way I can raise these funds. And we pulled in Tuesday into High Street parking lot with 42000 We needed $9,000 left when we pulled into the parking lot Tuesday. And God started filling the Raven's Beak. And as we shared this week, God laid on the heart of a family to give $60,000 toward the land purchase. The ravens are circling, and God is providing, and God is protecting. High Street, at the end of the service, you're going to receive a little card. Some of you just need to take that card and throw it to the side. Don't panic yet. And you just need to go. You've been dealing with God for years, months, weeks, and God, are you sure this is what you really want me to do? And, and you're just like me, and you're like, but God, what about and how to and what if? And this isn't going to work, and I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm not educated enough, I'm not qualified. And, and may I give you a, con, a, a, a great reminder? God already took into account our incapabilities when he called you. And he's going to take care of it all. And some of you today needed to say, hey, I'm going with them to Japan. We hear the go, 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 but we're up here saying, will you come? Will you come? Will you come? You're 150 missionaries. I speak for them all. Will you come and help us? Because the field is white and ready for harvest. Some of you, you're going to have that card, and you're going to look at that card and think, well, man, i got so many bills at the house. I've got so much going on right now. If you knew my job situation, if you knew my school bill sitting up, if you knew, God does. And my challenge to those of you to do one dollar. Well, that's not much. If you haven't started yet, just start with one dollar. If you've already been given, just to increase it, just one dollar or whatever God lays on your heart, but just start with one dollar. And here's why. Because over the first service and this service, there's approximately around a thousand people that come to High Street. That's a thousand dollars more a week that could be used for global missions. Times that in a year, that's $52,000 to go and reach the lost who've never heard the good news of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's why you need to do that. Because there's a Bekalu in Ethiopia whose father died and his mother left him abandoned, who heard the good news of the gospel through our soccer outreach and came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior and now serves in our church as a teenage boy. There's many more Bekalus who need to hear that there is hope for them. High Street, I've always said, it's your funds that send us to the field, but it's your prayers that keep us there. Thank you for teaming and linking arms with us to go share the good news of the gospel around the world. Well, we're going to let the missionaries go down because we're about to go to our candlelight time. And, um, but I just want to say a few things. First of all, will you get this, this card out, all right? Because uh, how, how do we send 150 million missionaries around the world? Let me, let me tell you how it happens. Ordinary people who have a heart to be obedient to the command of God to take the gospel to the world pick up a little simple card like this. There's not even a place for your name on it because it really doesn't, nobody's, nobody's sending you a bill. It's kind of between you and God. But what, what it gives you an opportunity to do is to think about how you're going to be involved. You know, I remember when I was a little boy, the first time I ever gave any money in church. I was just a little guy. I was in elementary school. And Cindy's daddy, uh, her daddy's name was Bob Hughes, and he came to my church in Manila, and he, he talked about giving to missions. And he introduced this concept uh, he called Faith Promise Missions Giving. Because, you know, this was the Philippines, and people didn't have any money. So his idea was, as he presented it, what if you were to promise by faith to be involved in missions and to give something? So what that means is you say, God, I'd like to give this amount of money if you'll provide it for me. And I'm like, I'm like an elementary student. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any money. Uh, I remember... Um, thinking, man, it'd be so cool if God would like give me some money to give away. So I took my card. I think I wrote 
two pages, as I remember. I can't remember exactly. How. You're not going to be impressed with me now, I promise. It, it won't matter to you. And I probably didn't send very many missionaries with the little amount I could give. But what happened was it, it put me in the game. So I wrote down two pesos, and my prayer was, God, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this. God, you know me. I'm like a little boy. My dad doesn't give me extra allowance. I get just enough every week for what I need. But God, if, if you would give me two pesos, I'd like to give that to you. I went to school the next day. Sat in the same canteen I had been in all, all the months before. Sat with my same group of buddies. We had our snack. Snack was over. My friend said, okay, let's go play. And all of a sudden, as they exited the building, I noticed that they all left the pop bottles on the table. Now, I always took my pop bottle back for the five centavo deposit. And I sat there, and for the first time in my life, I saw something I'd never seen before. I saw my mission offer. So they went out, and I collected all their pop bottles. And by the end of the week, I had my two, two pesos to give to missions. Now, the cool thing about that is not the amount of money. Okay, The cool thing is God began to work in my life in the area of missions. So I, I wonder today, maybe you say, I don't have any money. Well, I kind of think that you must, we should probably give to mission something as important as this to the point every year that it kind of stretches us. My wife and I have been talking about this. You know, I challenge you to give a dollar more, okay? Well, we're going to do at least that, right? And so... Um, what if you were to pray today, God, I'd like to give to missions? Because I don't want to live an ordinary life. I want to live a life in the presence of God, doing the work of God, watching the miracles of God. God, I, I really do care about the people in Japan, so I'd like to help the Shirelles go. And I care about the people in England and India, so I want to help the wheat go. And I, I, I care about the people in Ethiopia, so I'm, I'm going to be on board with them too. And and Allie, man, she's a courageous young lady traversing the country and flying around the world to take the gospel. I, I want to help her too. And when you, you give an offering, you help all 150. And you get in the game. I promise you, eternity will be sweeter for those who were part of the effort. You know what I'm saying? If you don't give anything to missions, it's going to become invisible to you. If you do give to missions, you will walk down the hall where all of the letters are displayed, and you will notice it. You can decide what you're going to do today. So, um, will you help send? That's the question. Will you help them? Some of you need to say, yes, I'll go. But all of us need to say, yes, I'm going to go. So I'm going to uh, ask you to get the cards. We're going to pray. And then you do what God wants you to do. How about that? I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to sell you on anything here today. I just want to invite you to be part of the work of God. Every one of you, kids, high school students, college students, mothers and fathers with budgets that you're always trying to make work, people on a fixed income, what are we going to do? This is the moment of decision. Let's pray.